This module will explore a few unclassified sources of high-resolution satellite imagery, and some of its utility. We will also cover a couple of different vegetation indices that can be derived from this data. We'll start off with a panchromatic image of San Francisco from a European satellite, SPOT5, taken in 2002. We'll define panchromatic in a few slides. The imagery was collected with spatial resolution of 5 meters by 5 meters, meaning that each pixel of data represents a 25 square meter area on the surface. Collection of high resolution data is possible by using sensitive sensors and large mirrors in low Earth orbit. We'll discuss a couple of satellite platforms in sun-synchronous orbit that deliver data that is capable of making meaningful observation of the land surface with detail. Landsat and Worldview. Landsat 8 is the most recent in the Landsat series, which dates back to 1972. The satellites are publicly funded and data is provided by the U.S. Geological Survey. It consists of two instruments, the Operational Land Imager, or OLI, which is responsible for passive detection of visible and near IR reflectance, and the Thermal Infrared System, or excuse me, Sensor, or TERS, which detects IR bands in the atmospheric window. OLI channels have spatial resolution of 30 by 30 meters or 15 by 15 meters in the panchromatic band. TERS data has spatial resolution of 100 by 100 meters. The orbit is daytime descending with an equa equatorial crossing time shortly after 10 a.m. Shown are the bands available now from Landsat 7, which is also in operation as of 2020. It consists of three visible bands, a near IR band, two shortwave IR bands, one thermal infrared band, and a panchromatic shortwave band. Landsat 8 adds on three bands, an additional visible band in the blue-violet for enhanced aerosol detection, a cirrus band similar to that available on GOES, and a second thermal IR band which combined with the other is useful for deriving soil moisture from IR radiances. What we've seen in previous modules is known as multispectral imagery, essentially just various channels in different bands. True color imagery derived from GOES, for example, is derived from a multispectral combination of bands in the shortwave. Panchromatic bands are a single wide band in the visible spectrum. They are usually the highest resolution channel available on an Earth observation satellite. However, panchromatic data will often be presented in grayscale. The act of pan sharpening is the act of using the red, green, blue, and panchromatic channels together to approximately produce an accurate representation of true surface color at the high resolution of the panchromatic band. To demonstrate what the panchromatic band looks like, spectral response functions for the four narrow visible bands and the panchromatic band on Landsat 8 are shown here. Note how the SRFs for channels 1 through 4 are separated from each other, capturing reflected radiation in different colors. 2 here is blue, 3, green, 4, red. The panchromatic band, however, spans many different colors running from 503 to 676 nanometers and including the entirety of the red and the green bands and a small part of the blue band. Therefore, true color imagery cannot be derived from just the panchromatic band. However, because the band is very wide, it senses more radiation than any of the narrower channels do alone. As a result, it can detect enough signal to capture reflectance at smaller spatial intervals. Worldview satellites are another series that has produced publicly available data. However, like many other private satellite systems with high resolution data, the data is proprietary. The US government has purchased much of this data and we will see an example shortly. Worldview is in a similar orbit as Landsat 8, although about 100 kilometers lower. It samples about 680,000 square kilometers daily. Within that area, data is collected in a variety of spectral bands seen in the leftmost part of the table. The panchromatic band has spatial resolution of approximately 30 by 30 centimeters, meaning that it can resolve small details on the surface. For example, if a typical human laid on the ground, they would take up about three data points in worldview. 
The maximum allowable resolution of a private U.S. satellite is 25 by 25 centimeters. Classified government satellites are known to use large mirrors, comparable to that used on space telescopes, that permit even higher resolution. The satellite from which a certain U.S. government civilian leaked imagery on Twitter is thought to have spatial resolution of approximately 10 by 10 centimeters. For these super high resolution satellites, we're mostly concerned with viewing the surface, although recent research, including some of my own, seeks to leverage public high resolution data to study tropical clouds. Consider the Schwarzschild's equation, shown here at top, for scattering. We want the second term to be minimized as much as possible to gain maximum detail about the surface, which is this L0 right here. The biggest challenge is scatter by clouds. This should be rather intuitive. If a cloud is between the satellite and the ground, the, the satellite can't see the reflected radiation from the ground. This problem can't be overcome. Simply an end user must wait for a subsequent satellite pass without cloud to see the surface of that location. However, aerosols and air molecules also cause scatter, especially the blue and violet light. However, both of these effects can be estimated to correct observed reflectances to a value more representative of the true surface properties. And this is important when making RGB true color imagery. For emitted IR channels, as with previous applications such as SST estimation, we want to maximize the first term of the Schwarzschild's formulation shown here at bottom. Ideally, optical depth is small and emissions are representative of the surface. If so, the two terrestrial IR radiances from Landsat 8 can be compared to estimate soil moisture, which is useful for drought monitoring. monitoring. True color imagery from Landsat 8 over Fiery Cross Reef in the South China Sea is shown here. In this well-known example, we can see the progression of a man-made island built in the South China Sea in a location where, in 2013, higher reflectance from the ocean hinting at a shallower ocean depth was located. In 2015, we can see a man-made island has appeared. In comparison, look at the resolution achievable by worldview satellites with a 30 centimeter panchromatic band. This image was collected by worldview 3 from an orbital altitude of over 600 kilometers. Another example of Landsat 8 RGB-derived imagery is shown for an entire tile of data, this one over the Santa Lucia Mountains along the California Central Coast in 2019. Previously, we considered that different types of surfaces have different emissivity coefficients. Likewise, the reflectance of the surface varies based on the composition of the surface. This plot depicts reflectance as a function of short wave wavelength for a variety of different surfaces. No doubt plants, the pink, yellow, and light blue lines, denoting grass, deciduous, and conifer trees, are not very reflective of visible light, although a small peak in reflectance to around 10% is seen around 550 nanometers. You should be able to deduce what color that corresponds to. Just beyond the red end of the visible spectrum, reflectances of plants increase to about 50%. We saw this in the first lab as well. Channel 3 on GOES was much more reflective in vegetated areas than channels 1 or 2. This is because plants reflect near-infrared radiation. This fact can be used to compare reflectances in the visible and near-IR wavelengths to deduce vegetation on the surface. One such index to do so is called the Normalized Difference Vegetation Index, or NDVI. It is simply the quotient of the difference between near IR and red reflectances and the sum of the two. Green forest would reflect lots of near IR, but make the visible reflectance small because leaves absorb red light for photosynthesis, but not near IR. Thus, the numerator would be large in such regions. NDVI ranges from negative 1 to 1. A value over 0.5 usually indicates lush vegetation. 0.2 to 0.5 represents sparse vegetation, generally, 
And under point two includes non-vegetated areas such as water, deserts, ice, or man-made structures. And low NDVI can also uh, represent vegetated areas with dead vegetation or brown leaves. Many other indices exist for estimating vegetation robustness. An alternative to the NDVI is the Enhanced Vegetation Index, or EVI, which incorporates multiple visible bands and is more sensitive to vegetative properties such as leaf area index. For the same Landsat 8 image of the Santa Lucia Mountains shown earlier, the NDVI is shown here. Dark green areas indicate high NDVI. These are present in vegetated areas, such as where I'm pointing right now with my mouse and over here. If you zoom in on your slides for this module, you can even see some individual agricultural plots in this region. Forests along the Big Sur coastline also show that enhanced NDVI. Urban areas such as the Highway 101 corridor and some small cities, seaside can be seen right in here, are represented by brown and white colors. These yellow-green colors, like where my mouse is right now, are representative of areas that are either sparsely vegetated or consist of dry brown grass that does not absorb much red light. These types of indices can be computed using a variety of different data sets on various satellites that collect information in the appropriate bands, and they can be particularly useful as an example for agricultural monitoring over large areas.